and welcome to a very special episode of Something Rhymes With Purple, where we're taking our annual look back over our favourite moments on the pod from last year. I can't believe we've been doing this for three years now. We absolutely love meeting up each week to discuss the fascinating facts and myths behind the words and phrases we use every day. And thank you so much for coming along with us and joining us for the ride and for keeping us on our toes with your fantastic questions that have us scurrying to the dictionaries and history books each week. And after three years, we showed no signs of slowing down and there are still so many subjects to dive into. So if there's a topic we haven't discussed and you'd like us to, then please do let us know. The email, as always, is purple at something else dot com. And remember, no G in the something. So let's get to the highlights. Where should we start, Giles? Well, as we're celebrating, it only seems right that we put on our finest garb as we revisit the royal and lupine origins behind what the Americans would call a tux. Yes, and if you look back, actually, it's sort of quite a, a sort of royal aspect to this as well, because if you go back to the um, latter years of the 19th century, the Prince of Wales at the time, Edward VII, was fitted with a rather special garment, and he had a tailor in Savile Row make this sort of bespoke ensemble that was more casual than a tailcoat, but more classy than a lounge suit. And thanks to him, really, the dinner jacket became one of the hottest ticket items in tailoring. Uh -huh. And it was brought back to the US by admirers of the prince who wanted to look suave and sophisticated and in 1886 the first jacket like this was worn to an autumn ball under the name of tuxedo because the ball was held at tuxedo park in new york and tuxedo itself is quite interesting it's a native american term from it's an algonquian name and it's thought to mean meeting place of the wolves but that's gripping Extraordinary Great, that everyday word tuxedo is actually named after a place and it was because they were wearing a fashion made popular by the Prince of Wales. The Prince of Wales. Later became Edward the Seventh. Yeah. Well, that's a real Anglo American story. Tuxedo. Let's check back from the States now, but whilst in the air, strap in as we remember Giles's most hair raising tales from thirty five thousand feet. I have so many terrifying stories. Oh. As a child, I used to enjoy going on aeroplanes, mainly to Europe. And then as a teenager, I began going to the United States of America, and I did enjoy it, though the turbulence I found it a bit uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, but as the years have gone by, I've got more and more terrified. I think it began when I was flying once about 40 years ago from somewhere in Italy to somewhere in the south of France. Mm -hmm. Nice. And got onto the, a small aeroplane, and I was sitting next in the front seat, right at the front of this small aeroplane. It only seemed to take about 16 passengers because mm -hmm. it was a little hop from Italy to France. And there was just one stewardess who was looking after us. And we took off and she was seated at the back. And I was seated next to this lady who I later discovered was a, a lawyer. Anyway, uh, we began to take off. And as we took off, there was a bit of sort of turbulence as we, we moved into the sky. And I, she could see that I was nervous. And so I, I reached out and I, I began to hold this lady's hand. And we were both equally nervous. We began squeezing our, each Aww. other's hands quite, quite hard. But it got worse because we began sniffing oh, no. and we could smell smoke. smoke. Oh, no. And then we were sitting right at the front. And as the plane was sort of still accelerating, still going up and lurching as it went up, from underneath the door to where the captain and the, the pilots were, smoke began to emerge, um, billowing. No. And then the door of the, you know, the, the bit to the pilot, yeah. banged open through the turbulence. And the woman and I were now in each other's arms, uh, squawking and squealing, and we saw through into the captain's cabin into the pilot's cabin and there the pilot was sitting with his co-pilot both of them smoking small cheroots no yeah and they were completely relaxed <laughs> totally they were just this was of course 30 40 years yeah. ago when smoking was allowed i think in airplanes yeah. but we didn't actually expect the pilots to be smoking but these relaxed italian pilots were having their little you know their, their black sobranis or their little cheroots they were as contented as could be one of our favourite things to do on Purple is uncover the secret lingo used exclusively in certain professions and with certain hobbies. From carnival workers to magicians to cyclists, there's a whole new language to master if you're going to fit in. Actually, should it be master or should it be mistress? Anyway, that's... Susie, don't answer that now, because before we touch down, let's remind ourselves of the words that might go over your head 
while you're up in the air. I am oh. full of admiration for the air crew, I have to say. It's interesting because, I, I mean, obviously I hoped to be a representative sample, um, talked to a lovely pilot from um, British Airways. So, you know, I wouldn't say that these are universal codes, but they were very interesting nonetheless. The one thing that surprised me was that a little bit like hack, which is a term freely used by journalists of themselves, so is trolley dolly actually used by air stewards of themselves, whatever oh. their gender. You rarely hear stewardess and hostess, almost never, but they will call themselves trolley dollies, which is interesting. But they have the most fantastic, just nicknames for each other and just lovely little kind of uh, nods to their life. So, for example, Delcy. Delcy, particularly in the US, I think is a popular brand of cabin luggage. So if you are Delcy dining, you're taking your own food in your suitcase. So when you get to your destination, <laughs> you don't have to fork out. A coach roach is a flight attendant who prefers working in the main cabin rather oh. than the first class bit. Sometimes they will call each other flying mattresses, tarts with carts or sky hostesses. Never use these if you're a passenger, only used amongst themselves. So it's self-deprecating humour, essentially. Absolutely. They're sending themselves up. But they always seem to be quite happy people. There's a kind of community mm. amongst these Guys. Absolutely. And they, they do have a good laugh, particularly at us. So the PACs are the passengers collectively. We are the PACs, P-A-X. Oh. Children are known as the crumb crunchers quite often. The crowd of people who rush to the gate eager to board as soon as the announcement comes, a gate lice. Oh, God. A spinner, I was told, was an undesirable or annoying passenger who boards late and then looks around helplessly or spins trying to locate their seat. Mango is a hot male passenger. <laughs> oh, how um, wonderful. Oh, there's a, there's a mango in E7. Yeah, yeah. or B.O.B., best on board. Oh. Klingon is a family member of a cabin or flight crew. An um is an unaccompanied minor. And I should just say, going back to uh, something that the flight attendants talk about, I loved this one. This is crop dusting. And that is when they said, when an attendant suffering from wind walks up and down the aisle to distribute it amongst the passengers. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea if that's true. Crop dusting. Crop dusting. I love it. Richard's so you could look up at them and say, if you smell an unfortunate <laughs> pong, oh, I see you're crop dusting today, are you? How tremendous. Yeah. Oh. Um, Fooey. Time to touch down and open a window, I think, as we pass the joystick from the cockpit to the desktop and another group of people whose linguistic shorthand has as many levels as the games that they enjoy playing. So there are clans who are groups of gamers who play the same competitive game together. There are guilds. Uh, they're groups with a kind of objective that they all share. It's interesting. It's, it's quite influenced by the film industry as well because there's quite a lot of uh, things going on. But you mentioned all the different games that have come about and there are lots and lots of different generations, if you like, of systems. And the console wa wars, as they were called, were people who preferred one company to another. Oh. So um, the seventh generation, I think, was the longest generation in gaming history. And there was a massive competition between um, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System and the Sega Mega Drive. And apparently the war between the fans of each of those still rages to this day. And some of them are quite funny. So PlayStation 3 owners were called cows because they were willing to be milked by Sony for all the accessories. That was the oh. idea. And then Xbox 3 360 fans were lemmings because they would blindly follow Microsoft to its death. And Nintendo's followers were called sheep who could be led down any path. PC owners were called hermits because they'd always stay inside. And uh, and so it goes on. So it is really interesting that, you know, this is a very, in some ways, way, it's a very accessible world, but it's also a very closed shop. You know, once you're in it, you belong, I think, very definitely to one clan. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not in any of these clans, but I did find the language really interesting. So the companies I've heard of, Nintendo and Sony, these are actually companies, whereas Pokemon yeah. and Tetris... Are they are games. games. Yes. So Pokemon is a short for Pocket Monsters. Uh -huh. And Pokemon Go is a sort of quite a big thing where you can actually go out and um, find Pokemon avatars on different sort of locations. In different What's locations. an avatar? So an avatar, it's your visual representation, if you like. And it's a really interesting word because it comes from the Sanskrit for 
the incarnation of a deity, of a god, when they descend to earth. So it's got a really sacred history. But in a game, it is, you know, you can create who you are, who you want to be. And that too is a little bit like, I guess, the filters on Snapchat and Instagram and things. You can make yourself be the person you want to be. And that itself is quite seductive and immersive, I think. Um, So Nintendo, some people think it translates as leave luck to heaven, but that is anecdotal, possibly apocryphal. No one quite knows where that comes from. Um, Sony apparently is a mix of sonos, meaning sound, and sunny, as in young lad, which the founders of Sony considered themselves to be at the time. Uh, Sega goes back to service games and so on. Oh, Pac-Man's got quite a nice history as well because it was originally called Pac-Man from the Japanese word paku, meaning to chomp, because a Pac-Man goes around eating lots of dots and they turn into ghosts. I can picture, I can picture yeah. the Pac-Man character, yeah. Exactly. But, of course, Pac-Man or Puckman, as it was originally called, lends itself quite easily to uh, the change of one letter, which would have (laughs) made it quite rude. It would have become Fuckman, essentially. And so they decided to change it to Pac-Man instead. And then I mentioned Mario and Super Mario. Apparently Yoshi, who I sometimes am if I choose him, uh, the little green dinosaur, that means good luck in Japanese. Let's get back outside now and wrap up warm in our dirtiest trousers as we look back to our January episode all about sliding down the white stuff on the mountains. Salopette. Yes. Salopette. This is quite interesting. So salopettes are those trousers with a really high waist and shoulder straps and they're padded. They're often quite thermal and they're worn for skiing. And it strangely is related to a French word meaning dirty. So why would you wear salopettes to get dirty? Well, the idea was that a salopette became a word used for a bib on a baby and of course when a baby eats it would get the bib very dirty indeed and I guess if you fall down a lot when you're skiing you will also get dirty and your salopettes will you know protect you from that but a a bit of a strange journey that one shoes oh yes to shoes or a shoes that's going downhill at speed in a straight line on a mountain this is what James Bond does in the opening sequence of uh, I don't quite remember which film it was when he's doing that amazing ski run. But Schuss goes back to the German. A Schuss is a shot because you go like a shot. It's related to schießen, which is to shoot. Okay, you're brilliant knowing all this. I know some of it you look mm. up, but nonetheless. What I do know is that snow, it's one of those words that snow itself yeah. has taken us into all sorts of areas. Give us some of the phrases that have moved into everyday currency from snow as an origin. Well, actually, I'm not sure many of them have really moved into oh. general language. It's just that there are so many words for snow that we don't really acknowledge, I think, and possibly because it's not a frequent enough phenomenon for us. But it is in Scotland. And I mentioned that the Scots have this fantastic word hoard for things related to snow. I mean, one that possibly has crept into the language through a trademark, through a brand name is Nivea. And Nivea mm. was, uh, well, Nivius in Latin meant snow white. And of course, that's the colour of the face cream, and that is why it was called Nivea. But otherwise, we don't really talk about a Nivius or Ningwid, which is another beautiful word for a snowy or snowy white landscape. But going back to Scots, you will find, for example, the verb fiefal, which means to swirl of snow. A flindrikin is a very light snow shower. If you want to talk about it, a single flake of snow that might herald more to come, that's a flother or a figurin. And then snowing itself is variously described as neistering, drifting, skifting. Melted snow is snowbru. Unbrak is or umbrak is the beginning of a thaw. I mean, it goes on and on. Possibly though, my f- absolute favourite, which is English dialect rather than Scots dialect, and that's crump to crump, and to crump is to crunch across compacted snow you know there is an unmistakable Mm. unique sound to walking across crunchy snow and that is crumping you will find that in the dialect dictionary and i absolutely love that one it's fantastic while Jans might not have been too comfortable on the slopes, he was much more at home, sitting in the first-class carriage of a steam train, sipping a cup of tea and watching the world go by. I, I'm constantly on them because I've, I've reached the age where I only do old codgers' work on TV. I ought to explain this to 
our listeners around the world. Uh, Susie Dent and I appear on television in this country, and I've now reached the age where I only do old codger's work. This means I'm sent on journeys by television companies. I think they do this because they imagine the viewers also are either wanting to be on journeys or are going on journeys, and so I'm either sent on canals or trains, and often there are these heritage railways that actually have old, genuine, old uh, steam trains. So I'm very frequently on a steam train, and I, and I love to be on one. It's very exciting, and the steam is so beautiful. It is evocative, nostalgic. I mean, it speaks of, a, of, a, of another era. If I tell you one interesting word that might possibly have a link to steam trains, and that is jerk. Goodness. So if you call someone a jerk, it may not be related, but certainly jerk water was the name for a kind of insignificant town in the US. So a jerk water was a kind of remote place because it it denoted the places where early railway engines, which needed to be supplied with water in those areas, would dip a bucket into a stream and jerk it out by a rope. So jerk water towns came to be ones that didn't have much else, but they did have a stream. So it was insignificant for anything other than that water, which was then used to propel the trains themselves and the railway engines. And it's possible that idea of insignificant then gave rise to the idea of being a jerk. This is why I come back to this podcast week in, week out. That's my takeaway of the week, that the word jerk, <laughs> meaning someone's a jerk, meaning they're a burk, meaning they're absolutely blue, comes from the idea of a jerk town where people jerked water out of the... That's marvellous. Yes, as one theory, I have to say there are other theories which link it back, which are not so colourful, which link it back to another word for a fool, but certainly jerk water was used as an adjective for things that were inferior or insignificant. A more serious tone now as we revisit one of the most popular episodes from the past year. In it, we focused on the topic of mental health and how our understanding of it has changed even in very recent years and how our language, as always, has adapted to reflect that change. Maybe we should explore some of those words that I've just mentioned. Lunatic asylum. Where, where do those two words come from, uh, for a start? Where does lunatic come from? Well, I think just before we go into the specifics, I mean, it's really interesting that actually um, we have created, in line with what you're saying, so many euphemisms for tiptoeing around that subject. And, you know, we, we dedicated a whole episode to euphemisms, didn't we? And our shifting squeamishness over time, whether it was religious profanity in the Middle Ages to, as you, you know, bodily functions these days, but also mental health. I mean, it, it's quite extraordinary, really. I mean, asylum is a beautiful word. It goes back to the Greek for refuge or sanctuary, which is exactly what we do when we give somebody asylum. We're giving them uh, refuge. But unfortunately, because of the social attitudes towards what were essentially the historical equivalent of the modern psychiatric hospital, the word asylum took on a sort of overtone that, as you say, was almost the unspeakable, really. But asylum really came from, I suppose, the earliest religious institutions which provided asylum in the sense of refuge. And one of the oldest institutions was um, Bethlehem, famously, which began in the 13th century as part of the priory of the new order of the lady of bethlehem in the city of london and it's worth saying that before asylums came along people with mental illness were cared for almost entirely by their families but often they ended up destitute and they would beg for food and shelter and there was no provision for them at all so that the idea of public asylums actually was in some ways it was it was a good one it was to provide that refuge but unfortunately as institutions, as often happens with institutions, they themselves were sometimes corrupt. They were also very poorly kept. Um, I mean, obviously, we're racing through a big, big chapter in, in um, the history of mental health, but the use of physical restraints was commonplace. But at its heart, I suppose, was the idea that they were recognising mental health problems and trying to cure them and even if that was misguided and in some in some cases you know damn right cruel the idea was that this was going to be a cure really and so the sort of changing attitude to mental health care can almost be charted through the language of these asylums and and how they came into the language but you mentioned lunatic i mean that goes back a very long way to the idea that lunacy was 
the result of the phases of the moon, the changing phases of the moon. So lunar, obviously, in Latin, is the moon. So that was the idea that actually your mind would be, and, and you know, a lot of people still believe this, you know, if you have a full moon, I think there might even be some evidence to show that actually your moods are quite affected and it makes you perhaps behave a bit irrationally. Um, so those those kind of beliefs still prevail, but that was definitely behind the word lunatic, and obviously that's not a word that we use these days. You mentioned the word Bethlehem there, or rather the name mm. of the hospital, Bethlehem. Is that related to the word Bedlam? People yes. talk about Bedlam. It is um, related to, uh, to Bedlam. So this famously goes back to many, many descriptions of the asylum as being a place of absolute chaos and of commotion with shouting inmates and they were called inmates at the time that were said to be balmy and balmy goes back to the idea of balm b-a-r-m being the head of froth on beer or tea even and so the idea is that these people were kind of frothing uh, at the mouth so again not a particularly nice metaphor there but yes bedlam almost became London's most iconic symbol for a while and, and it definitely entered language through that word bedlam which is again you know unfortunate because it's portraying that very negative side of um, and, mental and bedlam is a variation of the word Bethlehem it just is it a way is. of pronouncing Bethlehem in a different way exactly yeah. and yeah. also you'll find the idea of, of the asylum and you'll see this in Shakespeare as well in Hamlet and Macbeth it's used to explore the question of who was mad who was sane who had the power to decide and you know we've talked about this before Giles the fool in so much of Shakespeare is actually the soothsayer is actually the one who dares to tell the truth albeit through the lens I suppose of perceived madness um, so it's 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 fascinating well, however you're feeling, there are a few things better at brightening one's mood than a beautiful bunch of fresh flowers. However, since we had another trot through the garden last July, I haven't been able to look at an orchid in quite the same way again. Well, now, I know people called Daisy, Poppy and Lily. Uh, I don't know anybody called Orchid. It's funny how some flowers' names <laughs> have been attached to people, but others haven't. There, there were mm. people, I, there's a generation of people. I had an Auntie Gladys... And that, that um, I, yes. I assume, is a variation on gladiolus. Yeah, I th well, gladiolus is so named because of its shape, because its petals are shaped like swords. So gladiolus is actually named after, well, it's a sibling of gladiator, Goodness. Um, if you like, a sword bearer. But it's a really good point. I don't know whether gladius is actually to do with gladiolus. Oh, I'm sure you it must be. Like, thought like, so, yeah. Because it's the same generation people also called hyacinth. Do you remember the wonderful character yes. Hyacinth Bouquet? Hyacinth Bouquet. Great TV um, sitcom. So I'm just looking it up here and it says Gladys is a female name from Welsh, oh. which bears the meaning of royalty, oh. princess. Conversely, though, it has also been speculated to be from the Latin diminutive gladiolus, meaning small sword. So I don't know why Gladys would be associated with a small sword, but maybe Gladys was a warrior. Who knows? Orchid. Uh, I yes. think it's rather a good name. I mean, Poppy, Daisy and Liddy tend to be girls' names. Orchid could be rather a good boy's name. Well, yes, you're spot on there. Oh. And I think you might have sussed something here. That There's probably a good reason, to be honest, why children aren't called Orchid or Orchis these days, because it actually goes back to the Greek for a testicle, because the flower's roots have long been thought to resemble the testicle. And you will remember that avocados are also named after the Aztec for testicles. So, um, yes, bollocks are everywhere. And I mean that too botanically, because there are lots of plants called bollocks or ballocks. So there's ballock wort as well, all because of the shape. I should say ballot word, not ward. So orchid means testicle. Yes. And is the orchid look testicular? It does, really, if you think about it. Gosh. Yes. Next time you see an orchid, have a study. Well, I, I will. It's sort of slightly put me off the orchid. <laughs> uh, don't tell me the peony is named after the penis. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is a relief. No, no, this is a lovely bit of Greek myth, actually. So peonies were believed, like so many plants, I mean, you know, we just, of course, herbalists still operate very much today, but throughout the ages, flowers and plants have been thought to have healing powers. So peony is thought to take its name from Peon. He was the physician of the gods. So it's all about its, you know, offering of a panacea. One of the most fascinating episodes of the last year came about after a trip to the circus when we decided to shine a light on the underground language used by fairground workers, theatre performers and, for a time, 
the homosexual community in London. So let's once more say, Bona Tavada, your dolly eek, to the wonderful world of Polari. Oh no, missus, no, titter ye not. <laughs> so that zhuzh, the, the reverse of zhuzh, because if you're zhuzhed, you're, you're, you're looking pretty good, is naff, something that's yes. naff. Now, is that is that Polari? Because it's a word we use all the time now, something that isn't very good is naff. Yeah, well, again, that featured in Julian Sandy, didn't it? Something like, I couldn't be doing with a garden like this. I mean, all of them horrible little naff gnomes. So, Round the Horn definitely brought the word into the wider British vocabulary, and it became really famous when Princess Anne was reported to have told photographers to naff off <laughs> when they snapped her coming off her horse at the Babington Horse Trials. Although, apparently, Jazz, you might know this, one reporter who was there said that this was actually a euphemism by journalists because she actually said <laughs> something a lot worse. Oh, I can um, believe it. I can believe yes. it, yes. So to what extent the, you know, the verb and the adjective are connected is disputed. So the verb is recorded in the 1950s and that might simply be a variation on F off. So if you naff off, you F off and F is obviously a written version of the letter F, which stands for fuck. So others think that NAF is an acronym based on the phrase not available for fucking though that is almost certainly what we call a backronym so that's almost certainly something that is you know what has been worked backwards some dictionaries say it was formed as backslang from fan which was a form of fanny so obviously this is all quite rude this is in the british sense of the female genitals and some say it comes from NAFI n-a-a-f-i the navy army and air force who provide, you know, canteens and shops for British service personnel. But why they would be NAF, I'm not sure. Well, because the, the food best... wasn't up to much. Oh, it's NAF. Oh, OK. You go to the NAFI, it's that's NAF food. That, to me, sounds most credible because a lot of these guys, particularly, for example, Kenneth Williams, I know, in the late 1940s, he was in the uh, British Army and in the yeah. Far East. And they were there was a concert party they did where they, the blokes dressed as women. And he was there with Stanley Baxter, with John Schlesinger, with Peter Nichols, who then wrote a play about it all that became mm. a film with John Cleese. Anyway, that's by the by. But they would have known the naffy and they would certainly have said the food there was naff. Naff means bad. It's negative, isn't it, it basically? Yeah, we're saying so it's kind of, it's not bad so much. It's a bit naff. It's just like it's not cool, is it? And actually, the most likely origin, I know you like the naffy one, is that it comes, and you have to think about the influences that we talked about with Polari, the 16th century Italian naffa, G-N-A-F-F-A, -F -F -A, which was a not very nice person. And in Polari, you will find things like naff only, like a dreary man. So it, that's the most plausible origin, is that it takes us back to um, Italian. Oh, yes. But, you know, who knows? Often looked at as the naffest form of joke telling, puns are just as likely to make you laugh as let out a tired groan. Susie certainly wasn't convinced at first, but I think I won her over in the end. Shall I quickly tell you where pun comes from, by the way? Please. It's, it's a kind of a humorous riff, I suppose, on punctilio. And a punctilio is a fine or petty point of conduct or procedure. But here the, the um, emphasis is on the fine because it's a very nuanced, I suppose, bit of wordplay. I would argue that puns are very often not very nuanced. But anyway, that, that is the origin of it. And it's also known as paranomasia, which comes from the Greek para meaning beside and onomasia meaning naming. Um, onomastics is the study of names. So that's where the, that's where the pun comes from. And uh, it's an art. It's an art. And, it, and you're right. It does have an ancient heritage. I mean, many of the literary giants of the past have been master punsters. Shakespeare reveled in puns. Yes. Ask for me tomorrow, says Mikushio, as he's about to die, and you shall find me a grave man. Mm. Another English, well, actually Irish playwright, Richard Brinsley Sheridan, punned his way into a lovely compliment addressed to a lovely girl called Miss Payne, uh, spelled P-A-Y-N-E. Tis true I am ill, but I cannot complain, for he never knew pleasure who never knew pain. It's mm -hmm. quite nice, isn't it? It is uh, quite nice. Yeah, and I, I, love, I love the fact that, especially with Shakespeare, it's a bit of a kind of word detection game because quite often his puns are very much based on the vocabulary of the time and the sort of double entendre of the time. So they're not always very obvious to modern ears, but if you do some unpacking, you realise just how clever they are. That's it. It is the cleverness of it. Hilaire Belloc wrote his own punning epitaph. When I am dead, I hope it may be said, his sins were scarlet but his books were read. <laughs> that is clever. Uh, there, there was a headline, uh, Ernest Hemingway, when he died, 
uh, he'd, he'd been known as Papa, Papa Hemingway. And one of the, a newspaper, it may have been the New York Times, uh, had a famous headline that simply read, Papa Passes, which was a, a literary joke because Pippa Passes is a, a famous phrase, I think, from a poem by Robert Browning. So that really was quite ingenious. Oh, and newspaper headline writers, I mean, they rely on the pun, don't they, for their humour, and some of them are genius. Some of them are just um, slightly annoying. Um, in the Euros, of course, England are playing Germany, and I'm already dreading the puns that are going to appear for that. In fact, by the time this comes out, they'll probably have been and gone, but that, they always elicit the worst kind of puns, in my view. Some stand the test of time. In my pun collection, I have one from a novel written by Richard Hughes in 1938. The novel was called In Hazard, and this is the sentence. Presently, she told Dick she had a cat so smart that it first ate cheese and then breathed down the mouse holes with bated breath to entice the creatures out. Do you get it? Bated breath. Bated breath because it's the cheese which is the bait. Bated, if it's the cheese, is a bait. It's B-A-I. Mm, you have to know your English there, yes. But baited, mm. to mean anticipating, is B-A-T-E. Well, baited actually, baited breath actually means uh, shortened breath. So you're kind of yeah. breathing quite uh, quite shallowly in expectation. So it's a shortening of abated. So so there's a wonderful pun, two different spellings in the same... I mean, this is... this is. I mean, there, for me, there's a kind of erotic charge in this. That's a homophone, um, that one, isn't it, then, the baited? Yes. And a lot of puns rely on those. Homophone, homograph? Mm. What is a homophone? What is a homograph? Oh, homograph is a word that is spelled the same as another, but not necessarily pronounced the same, um, and usually Ooh. has come from a completely different root. So if you take bow, uh, to take a bow, and bow, oh, and bow, the bow that you might have in your hair, a homophone is uh, a word that has the same pronunciation as another, but again, different meaning, different origins or spelling. So new, as in new pair of shoes, and I knew that, for example. And then you have you have the homonym, which is not too far away, actually. So homonym is one of two or more words that has the same spelling or, or pronunciation, but different meanings and origins. So there's a whole collection there. And actually, they are quite often the bedrocks of puns, aren't they? They certainly are. I mean, let me give you an example here. And this is one of my favourites, because I think it could hardly be better, and it could also hardly be worse. It's the payoff to a famous story written by Bennett Cerf. And it's the story is about a private detective who is hired to trace a missing person named Ree, R-H-E-E. Mm -hmm. And this man, Ree, used to work for Life magazine, which was a hugely famous magazine in America, in New York. Eventually, the detective ran his man to ground and exclaimed, Ah, sweet Mr. Ree of life, at last I've found you. <laughs> and of course, our biggest highlight of the last year was bringing all those puns and linguistic stories to the stage and visiting thousands of you across the UK, where you asked brilliant questions, pulled us up on our mistakes, and even showed off your fine singing voices. Oh, well, wasn't that an exciting interval? Oh, that's marvellous. There were some traumatic moments during the interval, because more than one person came up and said, do, do, <laughs> nothing to do with The Simpsons, much earlier than that. Laurel and Hardy. Oh. That's what they're all saying. Wow. So are, are they well, right? Well, I do know that the, I'm just trying to find um, if I can actually work, work out how to use an iPad. I do know that The Simpsons is credited in the OED, but whether or not it's the first one, I can, if you keep talking just. But I mean, you see, good at not that. everybody knows everything. The, the, it's rather nice to find that the Oxford English Dictionary doesn't always get it right. Or actually, it may get it right because it actually has different standards from others. Well, the work goes on. That's the, you know, we were talking about this yeah. the other day. It's an ongoing thing. So the word detection and the word archaeology, you know, will go on. So, OK, I'm looking at Doe. This is the mus Doe, musical a deer, Doe. a deer, a yeah. female deer. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, good. Oh, yes! Let's do... While she's looking up, should we do some group singing? Uh, oh, that's lovely. Let's see how far we can get with that one. Uh, is, does it begin with doe? Oh. Do, do a deer, a female deer, a, 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 a sun far... Oh, a, a, I call myself far, a long, long way to run. So 
This, you are what a musical! Oh, I mean, honestly, did you, I sense there was almost an erotic charge during that? <laughs> I mean, we all just came together in the most amazing way. As per usual, when there was an erotic charge, I was looking at the dictionary, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you, um, 1945, and it was that radio show Itma. Itma. Yes, Itma. it's like... that man again. That's the first mention of dough. And then the Simpsons are there, but not until, um, yeah, much, much later. So there yeah. you go. And that's it for this roundup of our favourite moments from 2021 and 2022 so far. Thank you again for being a part of the podcast. It means a huge amount to us. And if you want to get in touch about anything, you can do so via purple at somethingelse.com. And if you'd like more from us, then why not join the Purple Plus Club for bonus content and ad-free listening? Follow the link in the programme description if you're interested. We couldn't leave without a word to take with you into your week. And, of course, a poem from Giles. Excellent stuff. I can tell you, Amplexus, you'd never have guessed this. Amplexus is the mating embrace of a frog and a toad. <laughs> You're joking. <laughs> no, should you ever need it. <laughs> the mating... Embrace of a frog and a toad. Well, if you're writing a say, Ogden Nash probably would have found that very useful. People who write an the mating embrace of a frog and a toad is an amplexus. Yes. This is why people tune into this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> they also, some them. of them, tune in because I, at the end, always read a little poem, yeah. a favourite poem of mine, because I love poetry and I love the way poets just have fun with language. And one of my favourite poets is a friend of mine, Roger McGough, lovely man. And uh, last week, I went to an event where he was uh, celebrating his new book called Safety in Numbers. Carol Ann Duffy described him as the patron saint of poetry. I'm going to read a short poem about language, really, and it's by Roger McGough. It's called Tensions. Why is the past tense? All that unfinished business and no going back. Why is the present tense, having to make it all up as it goes along? Why is the future tense, the weight of expectation and time running out? <laughs>